Welcome you all to today's webinar. I heartily welcome our today's chief guest, Dr. Kam Hindumadi, who is here to deliver a talk on Microbial Pigments in the Food Industry, Innovation and Insights. I will extend a warm welcome to our President, Vice President, Convener of IIC, Student Coordinator of IIC, and other core members. I extend my solution to faculty member and other participants. The desire to create his own of the deepest yearning of that human self. Once again, I here welcome you to our webinar on. Thank you, everybody. I'm so glad in welcoming our today's chief guest, Dr. M. Indumati, Assistant Professor, Department of Food Technology, JCT College of Engineering and Technology, Coimbatore. Our resource person has done her bachelor degree in the biotechnology at Tamil Nadu Agriculture University, Coimbatore. Her master's in food technology specialization in food microbiology and biotechnology at Tamil Nadu Veterinary and Animal Science University, Tamil Nadu. The Doctor of Philosophy in Food Technology Specialization in Food Science, Food Microbiology and Biotechnology at Tamil Nadu Veterinary and Animal Science University. Being an ass assistant professor at Excel Engineering College, she, ha she handled a subject like food packaging technology, fundamentals of food preservation, food toxicology and allergy, food processing and preservation, and baking and confectionery technology. She is skilled in PCR and it's troubleshooting. Statistics, parametric and non-parametric, ELSI, SA, sandwich and uh, competitive cell culture, maintenance and passaging, western blotting, ST page, primer designing, microbiological techniques, development of uh, symbiotics, bioreactors and fermentation, column chromatography etc she has the knowledge on the softwares like cluster w2 blast sps statistics software and mega cap she has published six papers and their titles include production characterization and cy cytotoxic evaluation of uh, cyokinin pigment extracted from the pseudomonas erig eruginous isolated from the industrial soil resource, immunomodulatory effect of uh, casein, phosphopeptide isolated from the uh, cultured dairy products, characterization of uh, monoscorbrin uh, pigment isolated from the monascus populus, International Journal of the Chemical Studies, a review on bioplastic and its composites, and a review on bioremedization of food industry waste. She presented papers in international conference and various technical symposium. She is a life member in Association of Food Scientists and Technologists and in an International Association of Engineering. She is also a professional life member at Institute of Scholars. Moreover, a resource person is a, a volley player. She participated as the God of Honor given to the government of Tamil Nadu and the Chancellor of Tamil Nadu Agriculture University. We are overwhelmed to have you here at our event, ma'am. I hope that we are able to seek guidance and invite something from your experience. It's an honor and a privilege for us, ma'am, to have you with us today. We are thankful you here for making a present despite your busy schedules. On behalf of IAC, we wish all your attempts would result in great success, ma'am. Thank you. Now I hand over the session to our eminent resource person, Dr. M. Indumati. Please, ma'am, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Ms. Maitri. 
So very good evening to all. So I hope all of you are ready to attend this interactive session. So am I audible, my team? Can you tell me if I'm audible? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So very good evening, my team. So thank you, my team, for the wonderful introduction. I hope I'll. I'll give you all some knowledge on this topic. So, can we start with the session? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, I need someone to tell me if you all can start seeing the presentation. Yes, Maitri, can you see the presentation? Hello. Yes, ma'am, we could see. Ma'am, uh, in the media, I am Krishna Vini. Yes, yeah. yes, your presentation is visible, no issue. Thank you. Okay, okay. So once again, a uh, wonderful evening to you all. Mm, thank you for giving a wonderful introduction. And Dr. M. Indramati, Assistant Professor, mm, working at the uh, Department of Technology, JCT College of Engineering and Technology, Parameter. So since my expertise is on both microbiology and biotechnology, I will be giving you all some insights about uh, microbial pigments, its use, and what are its applications in food industry. So that it will be a good start for the young food technologists to start your research on this. Since it is one of the very less explored area, so I hope it will be useful for you all. So the topic for today's session will be microbial pigments in the food industry with innovation and insight. So it is basically the realm of microbial pigments in the food industry. So today in today's content, we see about what what is microbial pigments and we see what are its sources. What are the benefits, and what uh, why is it not still more explored by many researchers, and what are the technologies currently available? It's future perspective, and we come to the question. So initially, when we talk about pigments, so pigments are basically colors, which means uh, colors can be from uh, synthetic colors or natural colors. So natural colors, like I said, it can be. Uh, taken or can be extracted from any natural sources such as plants, flowers, or any insects. So, since uh, color is generally an integral part of human life and its culture, so when an organism tends to develop, so the main so the main thing that is responsible for that is colors. So, with the colors, the plant we can identify if the plant is toxic or not. We can identify if the animal is toxic or not, and everything has its own individuality, like. Uh, human beings and animals, the microorganisms like bacteria, algae, do have different types of pigments in them. They produce it as uh, secondary metabolites, and it will vary with different organisms depending upon their nutritional source, which is given to them uh, either artificially or in natural ways. Again, so these compounds. Uh, these microorganisms generally reflect these colors as any light absorbing compound. So they absorb nutrition and they give out these pigments as their output. So that's why these are called as secondary metabolites. And why are you interested in this topic basically? It's because uh, in wide in every food industry, you can say for any food products, the main attraction is color. So it can be from ice cream or your cool rooms or any food items you take. So color is the main factor. So it acts as an attractive key to some children to adults. So since we are using synthetic colorants, there are various disadvantages. For example, it says there some some chemicals have uh, have carcinogenic or they come from tumor or they come from allergic reaction. So since these are synthetic, we have an alternative. For example, if we have colorants from plants. 
I can give an example as uh, beetroot. Beetroot gives a beautiful purple, reddish purple color. So it is a natural colorant which does not have side effects, but it does have many beneficially uh, active components which acts as uh, good antioxidant or and so like that way uh, we are trying to extract colors from these microorganisms. So these microorganisms will become a revolution where many secondary metabolites or colorants will be uh, extracted from these microorganisms. So what are the microbial sources? So there are various microbes which produce colors or pigments that is non-toxic and can be extracted easily and can be utilized as uh, coloring agents in food components. Like I said, uh, the presence of pigments are usually very abundant in microorganisms including bacteria, fungi, yeast and algae. So for bacteria, <clears throat> I can give an example as uh, pseudomonas which has reduced a green color pigment and for fungi and yeast, I can give an example of monasters which reduce a red color pigment. For algae, we have blue-green algae which gives a uh, royal green pigment. So every microorganism which is there in the world gives some sort of pigment or colors which will be beneficial for themselves and for the surroundings. So these my what is the sociomet as so where are these microorganisms present? So they can be anywhere. It can be in the soil where you are standing, or it can be in the water what you are drinking, or where you are playing, any plants or soil water which is can be anywhere, any river, dam. So these microorganisms are uh, present everywhere in the environment. So only on the only difficulty will be identifying the particular organism, purify, purifying that organism and trying to extract it. So there are various procedures to extract the particular pigment from a bacteria which has to be optimized. So <clears throat> when we go for a uh, food color market, so there are two different types. Cannot be type, you can call it as a classification. One is the product and next one is application. So these are the names of different pigments like caramel, carotenoids, anthocyanins, perfumins, flavonoids, flavin, uh, <coughs> beta carotene. So all these are names of different color. Every pigment or color, natural coloring that is present in current scenario do have different chemical names and chemical structures. So what are the applications in food industry? You can use for packaged foods, bakery or confectionery, in your cake, in your muffin, uh, and in your dairy products. I tell you have currently we have uh, yogurts, we have milkshakes, so flavored milk. So for all this, in order to enhance the color, in some type of color interface. So instead of using synthetic colors, we can try to convert these synthetic col colors into natural colors by right? extracting it from microorganisms. There are various sources for these natural colors, but one of the cheapest uh, and abundant sources of microorganisms. So this is the color system for microbial pigments. So as you can see, uh, bacteria has different types of colors in its color system. For example, there are yellow color producing bacteria. Uh, the colors include carotenoids, staphylaxanthin, xanthomonin, diazanthin. So all these are colors which come under the shades of yellow. And when you when you look at green, you have phycocyanin, and blue, you have pyoveridin and phyocyanin. Black, you have melanin. When you go for uh, a blue or purple, you, go, okay, you have colors like indigo red and violacin, and astaxanthin, cyanxanthin, chlorodiazin, carotenoids, and flexiridin. So these are the a various wide range of colors that are available. Even some of the natural plant sources do not have such wide and visible color range that can be utilized. <coughs> so, so one of the most common color that is that is non-toxic and it can generally be found in most of the microorganisms is riboflavin. So riboflavin is also called as B2 vitamin. So it is basically a water-soluble pigment. And uh, generally nowadays synthetically produced riboflavin is available as tablets and supplements. But this riboflavin is abundant in certain microorganisms such as Teberomyces, Subglobiosis, and Asbia gossipi, Clostridium, and various other uh, bacteria and fungi species. So these riboflavin tends to help 
you uh, help us to generate some energy and use, use the oxygen and also increase the or decrease the vitamin deficiency that is usually taking place in children or adults. So use of, uh, we can stop the use of synthetic riboflavin and production of tablets or okay, drugs using the synthetically produced riboflavin. And this particular riboflavin from these microorganisms can be extracted, purified and used as supplement. So instead of giving it as a drug, we can use it to uh, use it as input additive in any of the food products. It can be your cakes or it can be ice cream, it can be a yogurt or soft drink. So any food application we can think about, this riboflavin can be utilized. Next is prodigiosin. So prodigiosin is a red colored pigment. So this particular microorganism produces a uh, teresia, produces a very bright red colored uh, pigment which can be easily extracted just by utilization of some of the sugars and nitrogen in combination. And these tend to have various medicinal uses such as uh, insecticidal, anti-fungal, uh, antibacterial, anti-cancer and anti-malarial activity. So it is said that when these, this particular uh, secondary principle, like prodigiosin, when it is adulterated or when it is added as a food directive, uh, in a milk and given to a malaria affected people. This study was found that around 50 numbers of patients were able to recover at a faster rate in addition to the drugs that were given. So this had certain anti-malarial effect on the health patient. So this is one of the upcoming and most promising uh, food microbial pigments, which is not yet commercially available due to many regulatory uh, activities, but once the radiatory actions are taken over, so this can be a very promising and revolutionary color that can be used in food industry. Because red color is currently used in any of the food products that we can see. It can, it can start from your fast food, to your cool drinks, to your cakes, to your uh, other uh, snacks, in all these compounds. So red color acts as a major color that is used. So next is wireless. So all these colors, Come in different shapes. Like you have seen first is riboflavin, which is yellow, next is the prodigiosin, which is red, and now it's violacin, which is violet color, and this is widely produced by a bacteria called Stromobacterium violacium. And this pigment is currently at a high demand and commercial scale in cosmetic and medicine industry. Because this uh, this particular compound is non-toxic, uh, it is it has many antioxidant activity and antibacterial activities and various biological activities, which is very good for and safe for human consumption. The only drawback you place in this particular uh, pigment is the extraction can be a little tedious process and it might require some training purpose because this particular bacteria will produce this pigment under specific pH, after, under specific temperature and under specific light conditions. So all these preferable and optimum conditions are required for this particular bacteria uh, in order to produce this pigment. So in my PhD, I had worked on this particular bacteria and tried to extract this particular pigment, which we'll see later in this slide. And we'll see some of the results or real-time results of how these microbial pigments can be utilized in food industries. Next is art pink red. So this particular art pink red is a trademark in China. So this particular pigment is commercially used and legally uh, used color in food, uh, food components. So this is also this is also called as red rice yeast. So this particular uh, yeast uh, fungus uh, produces a deep red color pink, red colored uh, pigment, which is generally used uh, with the raw rice and cooked rice. This is uh, naturally consumed after it's mixed with the food and consumed directly. So it, has, it, has, uh, it is uh, stated that it has a very good anti anti cancer effect when it is used as food supplement. And this is again, this is uh, recommended as a food color by Forest Alimentaries Commission. Like I said, it is an approved food color that is isolated from this particular fungus, which is penicillium oxypigum. So these are only these are only few of the examples of these of microorganisms which produce pigments. So these are the very common microbial pigments that are available. So when you go Google microbial pigments, you'll find 
these four main pigments in the just because these are these four are very commonly available and non toxic pigments in the is can be used in the food industry so when i said what can be the uh, drawback though all these have so many advantages there are few drawbacks uh, why these cannot be commercially uh, not at commercially available it is not regulated or it is not approved by our fsa or codex alimentarius the only reason is the the pigment production and the other secondary metabolites or by products that is uh, extracted or Uh, produce along with these pigments the first is the ph like i said for every microorganisms it will have an unique ph at which it grows for example cerecia cerecia grows in a slightly acidic medium whereas chromobacterium vallisium uh, grows at a uh, basic medium likewise with penicillin the uh, grows at a temperature of or at a temperature and ph of exactly at 7 or 7.2 so Like I said, every microorganism will have different pH and different factors. So once to optimize this itself, it will take several years to identify at what pH we can get the maximum yield of this colors. Next is the temperature. So temperature and pH always goes hand in hand. So when the temperature and pH only are in optimal condition, the the yield, the maximum yield from organisms can be taken. Next is moisture and aeration rate. So moisture. so generally my uh, water activity will vary for different microorganisms so initially <coughs> the moisture the too much of moisture content might attract some other bacteria or other bacteria in the medium when it goes when the moisture level goes below the water activity there are chances of the secondary infection such as fungi and yeast so moisture and aeration is very important again for some of the bacteria so vallisium is an anaerobic bacteria It is, a, it is a basically a facultative bacteria, but at some times it behaves like an anaerobic bacteria, which does not require any any oxygen or other gases for its pigment formation. But sometimes it does need a little bit of oxygen for its growth. Next is carbon, nitrogen sources, and other minerals. So, what are the carbon sources? It can be sucrose, it can be dextrose, maltose, lactose. There are various sugars that are available. So, we have to check. Every sugar, for which sugar, its uh, microbial pigment is yielded in the higher rate. So it has to be again analyzed and researched for every again when it comes to nitrogen, it can be a pepton or a peptide or amino acid. So what is required? So everything has to be taken care because even a small change in the microbial uh, source of nutritional source, there are chances of production of any non uh, non uh, any toxic chemical. For example, a fungus. so the major uh, and uh, toxic compound that is produced by a fungus is aflatoxin so certain microorganisms like monasters or penicillium does not produce any aflatoxins when it is given a proper uh, carbohydrate and nitrogen uh, source so when there is an alteration in the carbohydrate and nitrogen sources so it is stated that it produces aflatoxin so which uh, will be extracted along with the pigment so which can be harmful to the human beings or other living organisms so likewise any sources that is given additionally to the microorganism must be taken care of again the incubation period so every bacteria or fungi or yeast or an algae will have different incubation period for its growth and production of pigments for example cerecia will take up to 72 hours whereas the chromobacterium will give you pigment in 16 hours and uh, 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 microorganisms like pseudomonas will take up to Three days or four days for production, whereas your fungal and yeast will take minimum of fifteen days for its pigment production. So incubation period and providing of its nutritional sources is a very important factor to develop your uh, pigments. Next is the type of fermentation. So you have two types of uh, fermentation. One is a solid state, another one is a liquid state. So in solid state fermentation, so all your nutrition which you give will be in solid state. so for fungus and yeast kind of microorganism solid state fermentation is preferable whereas for few bacteria it is always liquid medium or solid liquid medium depending upon what type of substrate you use again this type of fermentation should also include all the above factors the ph temperature moisture your cnn ratio and the incubation period so these are some of the uh These are some of the factors that are responsible for the uh, 
affecting the microbial pigment production. So since once we have isolated, so what are the benefits you might ask me? So what, what is the actual benefit of these microbial pigments? Like I said, first is the anti-cancer, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, immunoregulatory, apoptic effect, and antimicrobial. Mm -hmm. So every does not ensure that all the pigments will have all of these characters. For example, uh, your protogenous protogenous has anti-malarial whereas your violation and your rapturing red has some anti-cancer and anti-inflammatory. But a common com common uh, activity which is which is generally common to any of the pigment is antioxidant. So antioxidant property is generally available in any of the microbial pigment that is extracted. Because if the bacteria generally itself has a radical scavenging activity. So when they ask by as a secondary metabolite, the pigments acts again towards its radical scavenging. That's why these pigments, even when it is extracted, has that particular antioxidant property. So these are the uh, some of the benefits of microbial microbial pigments. So apart from this, some of the some might have other defects also. So we have to talk about that, but that does not uh, cause any fatal effect to the human being when consumed. Next is, so what are the challenges? <clears throat> so we are utilizing, for example, we have started, some regulatory bodies have given approval for these microbial pigments. So what are the challenges that will be faced in utilizing these microbial pigments? The first is, so whatever species that we are planning to take for any bacteria or fungi that we are ready to uh, take for microbial production. First thing, the growth rate of the particular bacteria should be very high. For example, the, the doubling time of an E. coli is 20 minutes. So like I said, so these particular uh, microorganisms must be in a position to grow at a faster rate and give a maximum yield of uh, pigments in a given space and given time. For example, utilization of uh, fungi as a source of bacterial pigments. So to start its pigment growth itself, a fungi takes 15 days, whereas bacteria gives its pigment within three days. So within a span of 15 days, uh, the, my, the pigment production with uh, the use of bacteria can be of tenfold. So uh, the first thing is you have to know what type of pigment we want and what, the, what is the type of microorganisms that it will be utilized. And how, what is the space that it will require and what is the time it will require for its growth. So all these must be taken care. Next, next thing is it must be non-toxigenic and non-pathogenic. So like I said, so utilization of fungal pigments. So there are chances that these fungal pigments might produce some aflatoxin, which is a toxin. Or some of the bacteria might produce some spores, so which can be, again, the uh, toxic to human bodies. So I can give another example for uh, uh, this toxic chemical. The one next is, that is your Pseudomonas originosa. So that particular organism, which is called as a superbug, so it generally produces two types of pigments. One is pyocyanin and next one is pyoviridin. The pyocyanin part of the pigment is non-toxic and it is safe for consumption and it is safe for utilization, use of as food coloring, whereas the pyoviridin, which is a very blue colored uh, pigment, that particular pyoviridin is the most, it has all the toxic compounds from the uh, pseudomonas. So when you extract this pyocyanin and pyoviridin, you have to be on a very careful way. <clears throat> so again, so there are chances of some bacteria producing some other secondary metabolites which can end up being toxic or pathogen. Next is it should, it should be able to grow on a wider range of cheaper raw materials. Again, utilization of waste is a major worry in this current scenario. So the microorganisms which are trying, are trying to use must be in a position to use some agricultural byproducts. For example, <coughs> excuse me. So the violation which is produced by chromobacter violation. So it, uh, sugar cane waste from sugar from sugar cane industries can be used as a substrate for growth of that particular bacteria. So, it, so there are many studies which show that that particular chromobacter violation enhances its pigment production when it is grown under a solid state fermentation utilizing sugar cane waste. So the 
microorganisms which you are choosing must be in a position to utilize the, even the cheaper raw materials which is available and it must give be some use to the environment so that that particular concern must be seen in particular when you are taking the microorganisms next is again the major factor will be uh, cost ratio so since synthetic colors can be produced using few chemical reactions and others but whereas here uh, the natural pigments so since for example if it is a bacteria so you need to give the proper so we need to give its proper uh, source carbon source nitrogen source again the particular carbon or nitrogen source can be uh, very expensive for example a peptone or b peptide or any uh, <clears throat> carbon such as uh, your uh, dextrose and sucrose are very common but whereas when you go for a complex sugars like a racemose or maltose this can be at a expensive rate so all these uh, raw material or substrate level itself is a high rate so a uh, maltose organism utilizing these pigments and producing a uh, colorant which has to undergo further downstream processing and upstream processing so again and when you end up getting a powder of 100 gram can be as expensive or can be tenfold expensive than your synthetic colors. But when you see on the beneficiary side, so this particular natural color is again thousandfold better than any synthetic colors. Again, the same thing. So uh, when you go for your uh, confectionery items, again it can be uh, expensive, like uh, more than your synthetic pigments, and <clears throat> since it is a microbial pigment though this microbial cells will be extracted and only the pigments are available so there are chances of these microbial pigments uh, to react with the food component so in that case there are chances of producing any unwanted odors or flavors and next is extraction and purification so this can be very time consuming and again again it will be on the higher cost uh, end and expense So next is what are the technologies and innovations? <clears throat> so like I said, though this comes under very expensive terms, then but there are some technologies which are used uh, that can reduce the cost of these uh, these uh, pigments. First is strain improvement through genetic engineering or utilization of some biotechnological tools. Uh, tools you can improve the strain of the particular bacteria. So, by improving the particular strain, there are chances of higher yield of the microbial pigment or faster growth or uh, uh, reducing the level of toxic compounds that are produced. Next is the fermentation strategy. Like I said, every bacteria will have its unique fermentation condition. So, in those cases, we can use if it requires a semi uh, a solid state of liquid state or a solid solid state or a solid liquid state. So, after depending upon the bacteria, we can try to adapt those particular microorganisms into a different fermentation method through which we can know if the particular microorganisms can produce different pigments through any of the fermentation methods. Next is again fermentation of optimization of fermentation conditions on downstream processes. So, fermentation conditions like pH, temperature, the nature of the medium, the acid, the pH, again the lighting requires, or uh, for example the aeration. So all these can be optimized according to the different microorganisms that is required. Next is scale up from petri dish to large scale and industrial fermenter. So as researchers, we keep on researching in our laboratory level of how these pigments can be used as natural colors. But once it is scaled up, since Everything is small in a laboratory scale or a, when it comes to a petri dish scale. But when it, is, when it reaches the industrial scale or rack scale, again the cost of coal, uh, chemicals that are used or substances that are used can be reduced at a marginal rate. And so once you scale up, so there are chances of, to reduce the rate of these uh, natural pigments. Again, next is the pigment stabilization. So as you all know, some of the synthetic colors or even plant colors, for example, beetroot. 
so when you take a beetroot juice and try to convert the beetroot juice into a beetroot powder so at a temperature of 160 and 180 degrees celsius the beetroot powder tends to lose its color so from being red to purplish color there are chances for it to become to a mild pink color it's because at 180 degrees celsius the color of the uh, beetroot is not stable so but whereas in natural uh, in many of the natural or microbial pigments so these colors do not change at any ph or temperature so once it is stable even up to 200 or 300 degrees celsius so, so no other dish will be made more than i think 200 degrees celsius fahrenheit or 300 degrees celsius even if you are baking a cake it will be in 180 degrees fahrenheit so when it is under one if it is stable to stay under a temperature of 180 degrees celsius fahrenheit so and a ph so when some of the fizzy drinks are done or any acidic drinks are made and even if it is stable under a ph of 5 or 6 or when it is made to ferment along with the curd or your yogurt so if it is able to uh, again be stable under different ph and different temperature so this pigment stabilization can be improved and so when it is can be used in different temperature and ph level again this is one of the again the revolutionary uh, action that can be done so that we can stop using of synthetic colors and go into the utilization of natural colors <clears throat> so i would like to uh, give you tell you all about my experience like i said my phd uh, research was on microbial pigments that we have uh, successfully taken from four bacteria so these are the uh, dried uh, pigments that we have taken from four different microorganisms <clears throat> so the first picture is monastus purpureus so which has given uh, the second uh, uh, the second pigment which is a light orange colored pigment and the next one is penicillium purpureus which was able to give a dark red or dark orange colored pigment after uh, fermentation so these are the two bacteria so these two monastus and penicillium are fungi there are this particular two microorganisms which is stromobacter mylaceum and pseudomonas aeruginosa or uh, bacteria so this stromobacter mylaceum like i said it gave us the purple color pigment as you can see in the picture so this purple or violet color pigment was given by stromobacter mylaceum and the blue color is a pyocyanin pigment so the pseudomonas like i said it gives two types of pigment one is pyocyanin and next one is pyoviridin so this is the pyocyanin pigment which was uh, extracted after a huge struggle and um, choosing different isolation methods so and uh, it was a great success to isolate this pyocyanin from the pseudomonas aeruginosa so after isolating all these pigments we had initially taken some uh, cytotoxicity test in order to find out if these can be toxic to human beings and we luckily passed it was very fortunate for us to pass through the cytotoxic studies and we were able to say that these pigments are safe for human consumption and we had added these pigments in two different products one is yogurt and the other one is ice cream so this slide which you are seeing is a pigment incorporated yogurt so i hope you can see the different colors that uh, that are taken from the uh, bacteria and fungus and this is the Uh, ice cream in which we had added these different pigments so both there was no particular flavor for these pigments so it, whatever natural flavor you are adding to the uh, to the ice cream or the yogurt so it was able to reflect the same flavor this particular these pigments do not have any particular flavor and it was a great success to develop a product to prove it through natural pigments so what can be the future perspective so as you can see vidya we all know vidya right the rainbow color so through uh, through all through few researches and through uh, identification of these microorganisms so we can uh, even uh, i can extract uh, different colors like violet indigo blue green yellow orange and red so already red is commercially available and violet is yet to be commercially available so we can try to get the other colors through different fermentation techniques and through downstream processing techniques and uh, this can be a great uh, idea for the young researchers like you all 
so i hope some of you all will try to at least use some of your knowledge in this microbial pigments and try to get some insights about these pigments and try to incorporate any part of these pigments in your uh, researches <clears throat> so my conclusion for the day will be so uh, like i said so these natural colorants can be a revolution in food industry if if i if a single person like me can try can extract four different colors so imagine you young researchers who are many who can even if you all take a one single organism per person i'm sure you can all come out in with good colors that can be used in food industry plus these have demand these are demanded in this current food industry scenario these people these industries require some sort of revolution in these color sets because it is stated that the use of synthetic colors in any any food product or any cosmetic product any drug generally gives a side effect so if we as food scientists can bring about some colors and one we can claim it as a safe in food industry and so all these colors can be used in any further industries it can be pharmaceutical it can be a cosmetic it can be a paint industries so we can revolutionize this particular natural colors in the upcoming uh, researchers like so i hope i have given some insights about microbial pigment and uh, i thank you all very much for this for giving me this opportunity to interact with such young people thank you ksr and thank you krishna many for opportunity to give this particular webinar and it's a pleasure for me to handle this thank you very much guys so in the way ma'am i am audible Yes, you are audible. Ah, uh, thank you very much for coming this session. Ah, uh, so thank you very much, Ka. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Okay, what about you, Mosi? Thank you so much for your awesome session, ma'am. It's time for the query session. Do participants have any queries? The resource person is ab available yes. now to answer your queries. Hello, ma'am. Good evening, ma'am. Yes, good evening, ma'am. Ma uh, while using the microbial pigments input, how come it affects the shelf life of the food products, ma'am? So I can give you an example. Food colors will definitely not have any impact on shelf life because these these act just as a food additives, right? These these are not food preservatives. So uh, still no in no color can be used as a food preservative. So once it is added as a food additive. it can only enhance the color of your food product so the chances of increasing its shelf life is very low and also ma'am how come it is it's viable while adding to the food product ma'am does it's viable or it becomes uh, non viable ma'am uh, so for example uh, the extraction process of these microbial pigments are different for example the pigment like violacin so in order to extract the pigment that particular pigment has to be Uh, extracted using ethanol. So, what is an ethanol? We are using ethanol. No microorganism can be alive. So, in order to extract, so some of the pigments will be intracellular and some of the pigments will be extracellular. So, we are using some sort of solvents to extract these pigments. So, once these pigments are extracted, this goes under a process called as rotary vacuum evaporation. So, to which these pigments are again heated up to 80 degrees Celsius or 90 degrees Celsius. So, at that particular temperature. no microorganism or no cells will be alive so this is this is the microorganisms will not be viable when it is added to food products so it is just a pigment it is just a secondary metabolite for example the color uh, from your turmeric so just because you take the oil doesn't mean the plant is still alive right so this is again a secondary metabolite we are extracting it from microorganism so it will not be viable thank you ma'am <coughs> We hope that our audience has a clear vision and understanding of today's session. 
Thank you so much, ma'am, for making this session a wonderful event. Let's wind up this evening with a warm note of appreciation. It's a time to propose the vote of thanks. I would like to call upon Ms. Meera Devi from Mechatronics Department to propose the vote of thanks. There is always light if only we were brave enough to see it, if only we were brave enough to be it. Today, I take the opportunity to put all my gratitude into words. I consider it a great privilege to propose a vote of thanks to all the dignitaries who have witnessed it as a memorable and successful event. On the behalf of KS Rangasamy College of Technology, Institutions Innovation Council, I would like to express my gratitude to our Honorable Chief Guest, Dr. Yam Indumati, Assistant Professor, Department of Food Technology, JCT College of Engineering and Technology, Coimbatore for taking her precious time out and delivering a speech on the topic microbial pigments in the food industry, innovations and insights. Ma'am, indeed your words have inspired us. Today's webinar was full of knowledge and interesting things. It gave deep insights into the topic and also revealed some interesting facts. Thank you, ma'am, for sharing with us your words of wisdom. You take you took this event to a greater level. We will be looking forward to have more of your presence at future events. We thank you for being with us. It has remained a pronounced pleasure. With the blessings of late line, Dr. K.S. Rangasamy, MJF, Founder Chairman, KSR Educational Institutions, I extend my sincere gratitude to our Chairman, Sri R. Srinivasan, and our CEO, Dr. K. Tyaharaja, sir, in their absence here. A special mention to our respective principal, Dr. R. Gopalakrishnan, for being our constant support. With a deep sense of appreciation, we thank our loving teachers for their untiring efforts. I would also like to thank the people who worked behind the scene to make this event happen. Our president, vice president, and convener of IIC, faculty coordinators, and student coordinators. Also, thank you to all the students present here for paying your attention and learning. The essence of fruit is always tasted in the last and we believe that the last will be the best. I would like to thank all our students of IIC for working with us in making this event a memorable one for all. Thank you all. Thank you, Ms. Mira. Thank you all for your valuable time with us. Hope the session would have rewarded with you a valuable take home benefits. We request the coordinators to turn on their videos to capture the moment. The feedback link will be shared in the chat box. We request the students to fill out, to, fill out the feedback form. The meeting is officially ended now. Thank you all. This is Maitri signing off this MC desk. Thank you, Maitri.